How many of you uh, are just thankful to be in church today and you, uh, you, you honestly look back over this last year and you can see, if you look back, how God has had his hand upon you to get you through another year of life. We got to thank the Lord for that. Amen. This is one of 14 different services that we're having this weekend on our four campuses, Aqua Dulce, Simi Valley, Woodland Hills, and here in Porter Ranch. We got people watching literally all around the world uh, here today. And I just want to thank you for being here. It's an, it's an amazing thought. I mean, if you really think about it, it's almost overwhelming to imagine that there are about 2.2, 2.3 billion people on this day all around the world, in Africa, in Asia, South America, in the Middle East, in Europe, Australia, even up there in Iceland, that people are gathering together like this to celebrate and to worship this baby named Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. It's an amazing thought. This is actually Jesus' birthday, and so I just want to wish him happy birthday. We're going to count to three and say, happy birthday, Jesus. How's that sound, all right? I just want you to say, happy birthday, Jesus. I'll count it down. Here we go. One, two, three. Happy birthday, Jesus. Amen. Come on, let's thank the Lord one more time. There's a Christmas carol written in 1865, and the very first verse reads like this. What child, what child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch are keeping? This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. So haste, haste to bring him laud, the babe, the son of Mary. The question is asked, what child is this? What child is this? Of course, the answer is given. This is Christ the King. Now, I believe here today in this room, here this morning, that most of you know this child. Most of you know Jesus. Amen? But there have to be those here today who are not sure. You're, just, you're not sure who this child is. And Maybe you've never surrendered to him, committed your life. And so today, I'm going to look forward to explaining to you more about this child so hopefully you too can know him as Christ the King. Every year in the United States of America, there are approximately 4 million babies that are born. Think about that. Every year, about 4 million babies born in this country. The most popular month for a baby to be born in America is the month of September. Now, if you do a nine-month math calculation, this has to do with New Year's Eve celebrations. If you don't understand that, see me after church. I will explain the math to you. But I want to have you raise your hand and listen to the whole question. If you or you have a son or a daughter, a grandson, granddaughter, or again, or you were born in the month of September, raise your hand right here just to prove this point. All right, there you go. The question is, why out of all the babies that have ever been born in the entire world, why on this Christmas do we gather to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ? Why does approximately about a third of the world's population make such a fuss over the birth of a child born 2,000 years ago in a tiny little town over there in Bethlehem in the Middle East to a young peasant girl by the name of Mary? What child is this laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Well, the book of Isaiah is a, gives us a description of this child. Isaiah explains it all. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, the Bible reads, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. And here's the sign. A virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And you will name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. 
And to fully understand that verse, because I believe you've heard that verse before, you need to know the context of that verse. Over in Jerusalem, 2,700 years ago, Jerusalem was under attack. There were two kings. One was King Rezin. King Rezin was the king of Syria, which was up north. There was a second king named King Pekah, who was the king of the northern kingdom. So those two kings joined forces together, and they came to attack Jerusalem and Judah and King Ahaz. He was the king of Judah at the time. And in the midst of that battle, God sends a prophet by the name of Isaiah to go to King Ahaz and to tell King Ahaz, hey, don't worry, I've got everything under control. And then God said this to Isaiah, or to Ahaz. He said, he said, Ahaz, if you want a sign, just ask me for a sign and I'll give you a sign. And if you read Isaiah chapter seven, the whole chapter, King Ahaz refuses. He says, no, I'm not gonna ask for a sign. I'm not gonna beg for a sign. I don't want a sign. God says, well, I'm gonna give you a sign anyway. Have you ever said to God, God, leave me alone, and God said, no, I'm not gonna leave you alone? Have you ever said, God, stop chasing me, and God says, no, I'm not gonna stop chasing you? Have you ever said, God, just let me be, and God says, no, I'm not gonna just let you be? Well, Ahaz says, God, I, I'm not gonna ask you for a sign, and God says, well, I'm gonna give you a sign anyway. And it's in that context that Isaiah says, Isaiah 7, 14, look at it again. Therefore the Lord, what's the next line? The Lord who? The Lord himself will give you a sign. And here's the sign. A virgin will conceive, give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel. I love this thought. I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. Not only does God say, I'm going to give you a sign, God is saying, I myself am the sign. That's what he's saying there. I'm going to give you a sign. I'm the sign. Emmanuel, which is God with us. And what God is saying to his people that day is don't worry about the enemy you are facing. Don't worry about King Rezin. Don't worry about King Pekah. Don't worry about Syria. Don't worry about the northern kingdom. Don't worry about being attacked on every front. Guess what? I'm showing up. Myself. I'm going to be there. And when I show up, you have nothing to fear. Because I'm all-powerful. I'm undefeated. And my kingdom reigns forever. Now on the surface, that's good news for us here today. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess in an audience like this that there are many people here today who are feeling under attack. Some of you feel as though the enemy forces have come up against you. And you're wondering what the future holds. And if you're worried here today, if you're scared here today, if you're fearful here today, just know that God is here. Emmanuel, he's here. You're not alone. If you're feeling under attack, just look to God. God is still on the throne. He's still here. He's all powerful and he is undefeated. You have nothing to worry about. Now on a much deeper level, Isaiah's scripture is a prophetic word concerning the future. God in this text is predicting an event that will occur 700 years later when he literally, not figuratively, but he's actually going to come to planet earth as a child in the flesh. Can you say wow? That is unbelievable. But the biblical prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 is actually fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. We're going to read this together. I want you to read it out loud. How many of you are with me? How many of you are with me? Last night, they didn't do a very good job reading out loud. <laughs> 9 o'clock, did a good job. 11 o'clock, I want to hear you. Are you with me? Are you with me? It's just three little verses. Here, here's that scripture in Isaiah fulfilled in Matthew 1. Read it with me. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. 
because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord said through the prophet, that the virgin will be with child, will give birth to a son, they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see, 700 years later, Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled when Jesus is born. Matthew tells us that Jesus is Emmanuel. It is God with us. And this is the one in whom we celebrate and worship here today, the birth of Jesus, our Savior. But Isaiah the prophet goes a step further in his explanation of who this child is will be because he explains that when this baby shows up, and he's going to show up, it's not just a baby. It's much, much more. Isaiah continues his description of this child when he says these words in Isaiah 9, verse 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called four things. He will be called Wonderful Counselor. He will be called Mighty God. He'll be called Everlasting Father. And he will be called what? The Prince of Peace. Now, I'm sure you've heard of those four things. And one Christmas, not this Christmas, but one year we're going to take four weeks and we'll look at all four of those. But this morning, I want to just briefly mention to you each of them. Because if you're here today and you belong to Jesus and you love Jesus, and you've trusted in Jesus, then you have these four aspects of God within you. Number one, we have a wonderful counselor. Wonderful counselor. Now the word wonderful back in the Hebrew text means more than what it means to us here today. We we think of wonderful, that's like, oh, that's cool, that's nice, that's, that's great. But that's not what the Hebrew word The Hebrew word, here's what it means. It means that you have a supernatural counselor. That's the word in the Hebrew. You have a supernatural counselor. It's not that you have a nice counselor or a sweet counselor or you have a good counselor or a wonderful counselor. My my counselor's wonderful. No, you have a supernatural counselor is what that means. Sometimes I'm with my friends and we're in a tough situation. I just kind of, just as a joke, I mean, I just say it to be funny. I say, I, I, I need to call Dr. Phil right now. I need to call Dr. Phil right now. Like, how many of you would like to have Dr. Phil on speed dial? You know, you got a problem. Hey, I got Dr. Phil, I'll just call him. I actually picked up my phone this week and I said, Siri, hey, Siri, call Dr. Phil. And guess what? They called him. No, that's not true. That's not true. (laughs) I did pick up my phone and I said, hey, Siri, you can try this. I said, hey, Siri, call Dr. Phil. And the voice said, you don't have Dr. Phil in your contacts, is what it said. (laughs) But I want you to know that if you know Jesus Christ, you don't need to call Dr. Phil because you have a supernatural counselor. And he will lead you and guide you in all things. Amen? Secondly, we have a mighty God. I have a mighty God within me. I don't just have a supernatural counsel. I have a mighty God. And the word mighty, if you don't know this, it comes from a word that means warrior. Warrior. This child, Jesus, God with us, Emmanuel, is a God who fights on our behalf. You go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we're told that this child would make war with the serpent and that he would crush the head of the serpent, and he did. The entire Bible, if you read it, it's a story of victory where mighty warrior God defeats Satan, guarantees our victory when he defeated death And he defeated Satan by resurrecting from the grave 2,000 years ago. Can you say amen? Amen. This warrior mighty God is inside of you. You have absolutely nothing to fear in this world. 
Number three, it says he's an everlasting father. Now, most of us know what this word everlasting means. It means that, that he's forever. He's forever, which means that he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. Some of you here today, I know this to be true, you feel abandoned by your earthly father. Some of you feel abandoned by your biological father. It's way too common. But your heavenly father will never abandon you. Sometimes in life, you know, life is just like this for all of us. Sometimes you're up on a mountain and everything's great, and then sometimes you're down in the valley and everything's bad. Then you get back up on a mountain and things are bad. It's, it, you're, you're never always in the valley. You're never always on the mountain. Sometimes you're, things are good. Sometimes things are bad. But sometimes it's very common when you get down in the valley, when things are really getting bad, you start to wonder, where is God? And you, you wonder if he's ever, if he's still there. And, and the fact that he, you have an everlasting father means that even in the valleys, he's there. He's always there. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He's always there. And number four, he's called the prince of what? The prince of peace. I want to focus on this aspect for just a moment because of everything that's going on in our world today. Because as I look around the world, I don't know about you, but I see a world minus peace. I see the opposite of peace. I see war, I see strife, I see division, I see hatred. But Isaiah tells us that when this Emmanuel comes, this child is born, that he is the prince of peace. In the Hebrew, I want you to I want you to hear this word. In Hebrew, it's Sar Shalom. Sar Shalom. The Prince of Peace. Now, we know Shalom. What is the word Shalom? It's the word for peace. Sar Shalom. The word Sar in Hebrew is the word for Prince. Sar is Prince. Sar Shalom. Everybody say Sar Shalom. Say it. Sar Shalom. Now, we think, now here, here's where we don't quite understand this. We think of a prince as someone who, uh, there's a king, and the king's in charge, and the prince, well, he's just over here goofing off, waiting until the king's gone, then he's in charge. But that's not the Hebrew word for sar, for prince. The Hebrew word, prince, sar, is a word that means that he is in charge. Sar is, he's the, he's, he's the head guy. He is, he is supreme. He is the go-to guy. He is, he is the head per, he's the, he's the governor. That's what the word sar means. Now the Romans, the Romans had a word. Theirs was Caesar or Caesar, Julius Caesar, Caesar Augustus. Now the Russians, the Russians adopted a word, Caesar, or they pronounce it czar. The, you say, who's the head of the state? It's the czars. That's who they've placed. But in this context, when it says the Hebrew word, sar shalom, in Isaiah 9, I want you to write this down. What they're saying is that Jesus is the captain, that he is the supreme ruler, that he's the head of state. He's the head of our estate. He's the go-to guy. He's royalty. And he demands our respect. He's to be held in the highest esteem. Therefore, we should revere him. We should honor him. We should bow before him. It means that he's in charge now when he comes. That he's the one who's going to rule. He's the one that's going to reign. He's higher than the government. That everything in heaven and on earth will bow down before him. He has a kingdom, and there's no match for his power. There's no real competition. He, he's in complete control. He is Sar Shalom. He alone, is, here's what it means. It means that he alone, no one else, but he alone can bring you peace inside your heart. And isn't, I want to ask you, isn't peace what we're all looking for here today? Aren't you looking for that today? I heard a funny story, and some of you are going to get mad when I tell it, but don't get mad at me, okay? It's just a joke. <laughs> Promise me you won't get mad. There's this guy sitting on a train between two women, 
And these two women are fighting the whole time. They're arguing. And here's what they're fighting about. This woman over here, the window, she says, if I don't close this window, I'm going to die of pneumonia. And this woman over here saying, oh, we got to leave that, that, we gotta leave that window, but I'm going to die of a, a heat stroke. Got to leave that window. No, she said, no, we got to close it. I'm going to freeze it. You know, I got to leave it open. I'm going to die of a heat stroke. And this guy's just sitting here the whole time. And finally, the conductor of the train has come through, take the tickets. And they both pleaded their case. This woman's, I got to leave this window. Uh, close it. I'm going to die of pneumonia. And this lady, no, no, we got to leave it now. I'm going to die of a heat stroke. And, and the conductor couldn't solve the problem. And finally, the man sitting there says, I've got an idea. He said, why don't we just... Uh, uh, leave this window down and then she'll die and then we'll li- roll it up and then she'll die and then we can finally have peace on this train. I know that's a terrible joke, but there are many people who have a concept of peace that is similar to that story because they think that peace is the absence of conflict. And the absence of conflict is not peace. True peace, I'm talking about true peace, comes when you have a personal relationship with God, your Father. Then and only then can you have peace. Because peace, peace cannot be found in this world. And everybody's searching for it. That's why the government can't produce peace, because they're looking in the wrong place. The only way man has peace is when you know and have a personal relationship with God your Father. So there's two things. When you know Jesus, he restores your relationship with God. And I will explain this. All of us in this room, we've all sinned, we've all done wrong, we've all, we've all trasp, uh, trespassed, we all have transgressions, all of us. We've done things we shouldn't have done. We've said things we shouldn't have said. And any time we sin, it breaks our relationship with God and there's chaos in our our life. But Jesus, this son, this baby, this Emmanuel, he comes to earth, God in flesh. He dies on a cross and when he dies on the cross, he's bridging the gap between us and God and he restores our relationship with God and that's when peace comes inside of your heart. And I also want you to get this, okay? And I'm almost finished. Can someone say amen? Amen. Ultimately, when you know Jesus, he gives you a peace that will calm your fear in the midst of all doom and gloom. I want you to say doom and gloom. (laughs) Say gloom one more time. (laughs) Gloom just sounds gloomy. But think about what's going on in our world right now. I have a few pictures. Just look at them quickly. There was an earthquake this year in Turkey. This is a picture from that. There was a mass shooting this year in Texas. There was one just a few days ago in Prague. We have a a crisis on our border right now. And, And it appears to me that nobody's really doing anything about it. And it's a growing crisis. There was a flood this year in China. You probably don't know that because you don't live in China. But there was a devastating flood in China this year. Right now, while we're sitting here nice and cozy, over in Ukraine, there are complete cities that have been completely bombed, been bombed by the Russians. Just a few months ago, over in Hawaii, Lahaina was completely destroyed by fire. And then, of course, in Israel today, there's a war being fought between Israel and Hamas. And when I think about Christmas, I think of God coming into this world. I think about the world in which we live. It's full of doom and gloom. And only through a relationship with Jesus can you have peace. He restores your relationship with God. But he can calm your fears in the midst of all of this doom and gloom. And the word gloom is actually in the book of Isaiah in this context. If you read it, Isaiah 9 verse 1, this is what the Bible says when this sun comes. There will be no more gloom for those of you who are in distress. Now, Isaiah 9 1 should be one of your favorite verses in the whole Bible. Jesus finally arrived, the angels announced in Luke 2, glory to God in the highest, because now on earth peace 
comes to men on whom his favor rests. Jesus eventually grows and he begins his ministry and before he goes to the cross, he says these words in John 16. He says, I've told you all of these things so that in me, in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome this world. And Paul writes in Ephesians 2, he himself, Jesus, is our peace. I close with this story. There was a minister up in Northern California who gave a lecture. And after the lecture, there was a Nigerian woman she was a medical doctor who came up to introduce herself and to say thank you for the lecture. She introduced herself with a, an American name and they talked for quite a bit of time and he asked her, do you have an African name? And she said, I do. And he asked her what her African name was and he said it was this long name with lots of syllables and said that when she pronounced it, it sounded like a song. And he then asked, is there a meaning to your name? Do you, do you have a meaning? Is there, is there a meaning to that name? And she said, oh yeah, there's a meaning to my name. And he said, well, what's the meaning of that name? And she said, the meaning of my name is child who takes away anger. Child who takes away anger. And he asked, well, why did your parents give you that name? She said, well, there's a story to that. She said, when my mom and dad met, they fell in love with each other. They wanted to get married, but both of their parents forbid them to marry. She said, but my parents loved each other so much that they decided to get married in spite of the fact that both of their parents didn't want them to. And she said, for several years, my parents were ostracized from both sets of parents. And then one day, something happened. My parents got pregnant with me. And she said, when my grandparents held me in their arms for the very first time, she said, the walls of hostility came down. And the woman said, I became the one who swept the anger away. And that's the name my parents gave me. And I ask you here today, wouldn't that be a suitable name for Jesus, the child who takes away anger, the child who takes away the bitterness, the child who takes away the hostilities, the one who brings peace into your heart, into mine? Oh, he's a supernatural counselor. He's a mighty warrior God. He's an everlasting father, and he is Sar Shalom. He's the prince of peace. And no one, no one on this earth can have peace in their heart unless they have a relationship with Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, which is God with us. And I want to invite you today to invite him into your heart and into your life and to come to him and surrender to him. And if you've never made that confession of faith, to make that confession today. If you've never been baptized, be baptized into his name, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And let him give you the peace that the world is searching for. Amen? Amen. Now, I know you came today to light these candles. Amen? So we're going to do that now. How's that sound? Are you ready? Okay, I'm gonna light this candle right here. Mm-hmm. We have some people already selected to come up here, so you just chill. Now, I do this every year. Are you paying attention? When you light a candle, don't take the, lit, the, the candle that's already lit and try to light. You hold that one just straight like this. You take the unlit candle and do this. Everybody understand? All right, we're going to see how smart you are. <laughs> and be really, really, really careful here. How many of you glad you came to church today? Mm -hmm. Hold that candle, brother.
You can turn the lights down out there. You can turn the stage lights off too. Uh huh. Uh huh. There's people listening. Now we have two more services tonight, one at six and one at 11 o'clock tonight. All these crazy people. They come 11 o'clock at night, make the pastor stay up all night, grumpy all day on Christmas. No, 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 no. But if you know of anyone who you think they would enjoy being in a service like this, tell them they got two more chances to get here. Amen? Amen. Oh, you all did good lighting these candles. That baby's upset. <laughs> that baby's upset. <laughs> that baby's really upset. Okay, I want you to raise that candle up above your head and just take a look around the room here. And Isaiah talks about, you heard it earlier, I don't know if you heard it with, with the worship team, but the Bible says, Isaiah also says that Jesus is the light in the darkness. And when you give your life to Christ, Jesus comes to live within you. That light, that love, that grace, that mercy is inside of you. And you, just like this candle, you become the light of the world because it's Jesus in you. And as you raise that candle, I want it to be a, a commitment. I want you to say, Lord, I believe, I believe this to be true. And I, and I want to be the light in this world. And this is how we bring change to the world in which we live. Let's sing a few verses of Silent Night. Let's sing. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin mother and child, holy and so tender and mild sleep in heavenly peace sleep in heavenly peace silent night holy night shepherds quake and Glory stream from heaven afar. Heavenly hosts sing Alleluia. Christ the Savior is born. Christ the Savior is born. Silent night. Holy night, Son of God, love's pure light, radiant beams from thy holy face, with the dawn of redeeming grace, Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. Lord at thy birth. Oh, I want to.
wanna wish you a very merry and blessed Christmas. God bless you and thank you so much for being here today. And before anybody leaves, no one can leave until all these candles are blown out and nobody likes to do this, but you have to blow those candles out. Don't anybody leave until these candles are out. <laughs> Trying to help you here, keep you alive for next Christmas Eve. <laughs> Brother, put that candle out. Because the last person who puts the candle out has to collect all the candles. <laughs> Up there, I need that candle out, please. I need that candle out, all right. That guy does not do well in school. <laughs> all right, God bless you and thank you for being here today.